Welcome back to On Texas Football. This week's edition of Texas versus the SEC is brought to you by my bookie, I'm CJ Vogel, and that's Jerry Hamilton. And my bookie's got a special message for all you On Texas Football listeners. Yeah, absolutely, guys. Thank you very much to my bookie. Uh, with all the excitement of this season, make sure you're in the game with my bookie. Bet any matchup, hundreds of college player props, and take advantage of the whis- weekly risk free bets. The best part, is it you can do it all the time, anytime, anywhere, straight from your phone? Visit mybookie.ag and use promo code on Texas to get started. It's my bookie's 10th year anniversary, and they're rolling out the red carpet for betters. Bet big and bet confident with risk free Thursdays. If you if your boosted bet doesn't hit, you'll get your money back. Weekly no sweat, win win bets all season long. And sign up now using my on Texas all caps to cash in on a double deposit bonus it's a no-brainer double the cash in your account before you even place your first bet but don't wait because it's only limited time availability for those who have been playing with my bookie they've got something for you as well a brand new loyalty rewards program in my bookie plus all caps it's simple the more you play the more you earn and as you progress through the tiers unlock exclusive promotions epic giveaways and cash back in your account Thank you very much to my bookie uh, for sponsoring this episode of On Texas Football. Make sure you're in the game with my bookie. Play any matchup, hundreds of college player props, and more. Plenty of big games this weekend, Jerry, and that you can get active on my bookie for. But we're going to talk about it for Texas in terms of what does that mean for the SEC race. We'll talk about uh, Texas Vanderbilt. You know, what does that line look like? How favorable? Could that be for Texas? And, of course, some other big notable games, LSU, Texas A&M, that's going to be top of the list, as well as later on in this episode, who's been surprising in the SEC and who's been disappointing? You know, I think you could look north of the Red River for that answer, but we'll certainly dive into that here later, as well as any coaches through week eight going into week nine that are on the hot seat. I know that there were a few coming into the season for SEC opponents. Have they played their way off? We'll discuss that coming up, but we're starting right now with Texas Vanderbilt. Texas needs a good offensive performance. Uh, 18-point favorites right now on the road to a top 25 team. Let's keep that in mind, right, because Vanderbilt does have a number by their name. And the the over-under right now sitting right around 52-53. First and foremost, to cover a number of that size, Jerry, it has to start with the offense. And for Texas, especially over the last three weeks, this offense has been in a bit of a rut. So this is a huge opportunity for Texas to find momentum, to get back to where they were prior to the, the Quinn Ewers injury, and then get more so than anything, some momentum going into the bye week. Where do you see this Texas offense kind of performing on the road against Nashville on Saturday? Or against well, Vanderbilt? yeah, for me, this game is all about the Texas defense, not the splash plays, not the big plays, not the sports center plays. It's about gap integrity. It's about diagnosing from the linebacker position. It's about playing with discipline in the secondary with your eyes. If Texas plays a disciplined football game defensively, I think that makes it much tougher on Diego Pavia and the Vanderbilt offense. Diego Pavia feeds on off-schedule plays. He has such an instinctive player. He, uh, He sees when you lose your gap integrity, and he takes advantage of that in the quarterback run game. I think if Texas plays a sound defensive game, I think they walk out uh, of Nashville with a 34 to 20, 30 to 20 type of win. I think Texas is two touchdowns better on the road. We'll see if they deliver. Yeah, we'll see if they cover that number again. It feels like it's been rising, which it rose early in the week against Georgia, and then it came back down to earth a little bit. I believe it closed at four after reaching five and a half at some point uh, last week. But Right now, Texas 18-point favorites. And to your point, Jerry, I I look at what Vanderbilt does. I mean, Diego Pavia, I mean, it it feels very similar, probably a more refined quarterback throwing the football. But a 2023 Jason Bean Kansas offense, right? They like to move the football. Uh, They like that triple option with the throwing attached to it. Obviously, Diego Pavia, he's got magic more so than really any quarterback in the country at the moment. But – you know, it's going to be a good test. Fortunately for Texas, Michael Hawkins two weeks ago provided some early looks on triple options, some moving of the pocket containment. That's going to be key here as well. Texas also sitting with one loss in the SEC. So 
they're up against the wall in terms of their ultimate goal of winning the SEC in, in year one, making the playoff and seeing how they go uh, from there. Uh, speaking of which, one losses in the SEC. There are seven teams still, quote unquote, alive in the running to make it to Atlanta. And that could obviously change as the season progresses. But uh, LSU, Texas A&M, they're both undefeated. And then there's five schools right after that with one loss in conference play so far. I have a tough time believing that a team of two losses will make it to Georgia or make it to Atlanta for the SEC championship game. Yeah. But we'll see. Of course, the dominoes still have to fall. Looking towards this weekend and some of the big matchups there, let's start with the top because I mentioned Texas A&M, LSU, two of the undefeated teams, the only two undefeated teams in conference play. They match off against one another this weekend in College Station. Two-point spread in favor of the Aggies. What are we thinking there, Jerry? You know, kind of like last week was an offensive line game for Georgia, uh, verse, uh, for Texas versus Georgia. It is for LSU versus A&M. The difference is uh, LSU's on the road. But LSU's offensive line has been playing extremely high level. Um, and this week they're on the road against a really good defensive front, arguably the best defensive front they've played against this season. Um, so we'll see where that goes uh, uh, for LSU. But if the LSU offensive line – plays at a high level, then Garrett Nussmeyer, will, he, he will make throws and Caden Durham will run the football. That's the key, though. LSU's got a balance in this game. In terms of uh, A&M offensively, you know, Connor Wingman's got to have a bounce back game, right? I mean, we've talked a lot about Quinn and Carson Beck. They didn't have good games last week. Connor Wingman didn't really either. He had two interceptions, could have had a couple more in that win over at Mississippi State. He's got to play a higher level game. This week, the big thing for LSU for me is if you watch the Missouri game against AM, Missouri's offensive and defensive lines couldn't hold up in that game. They got whooped. And they got whooped because Missouri had receivers running open mm -hmm. in that game. If LSU's offensive line plays at a high level, I do think they will score points in college chasing. The key is does can LSU stop the AM run game, which has improved offensive lines better? Backs are running well. Le'Veon Moss, a really good player. Because if AM runs it well, that takes pressure off of uh, off of the AM quarterback, Connor Weekman. I tend to let go with AM because it's a home game and I think it's going to be a wild environment. But then I think back and I went with Texas last week too. So, I mean, I, I think if LSU's offensive line plays really well, it will be something te Texas A&M hasn't had to face this year because Notre Dame did not have that level of offensive line play. I've kind of contradicted myself just a little bit in this game because, listen, I think the home field is going to have a big part of a and success here, right? That momentum in Cal Field, that means something. With that said, LSU's had a lot of success when these teams are ranked and play one another. They've kind of been, you know, the, the, the dominant team in this series as of late. Uh, and then on the other side, I look at it and say, all right, well, who has the better offensive line? I lean LSU. Who has the better quarterback? I lean LSU. Who has the better offensive playmakers? Again, I lean LSU with Kyron Lacey, Caden Durham, the way that he's kind of evolved in that offense as well. But still, I I can't see myself not picking Texas A&M right now. That feels crazy. I, I Again, I, I have that mental block right now with LSU because I had them as an 8-4 and four team coming into the year. They've surprised me, but they've had some key injuries do they travel well against Texas A&M? We'll see. But there are some key advantages offensively that I think that they come into this game with. We'll see. But that's obviously the big game yeah. right now in the SEC. Another game to keep a close eye on is Alabama-Missouri. And, of course, Alabama sitting in conference play after losing to Tennessee a week ago with two losses. Right now they're on the far outside looking in in terms of what it takes to get to Atlanta. Missouri, on the other hand, still alive, right? You know, they're 6 and one Two and one in conference play. They took the loss uh, earlier in the year to Texas A&M. They actually defeated Vanderbilt in overtime. Are we to believe that Van uh, Missouri will be still alive in this hunt after this weekend? Because I don't see it. I think that team is a little bit soft this year in the trenches. I I'm not going to act like I've watched Missouri's backup quarterback in practice every day like Eli Drinkwitz. But if Brady Cook can't go, that's a tough. That's a tough ask, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the reality, CJ. I think what happens this weekend is Alabama knocks Missouri out. I, I think that's what's going to happen. I mean, if Alabama's going to rally the troops, this weekend's got to be it. I mean, no doubt about it. I think Alabama has a physicality, like you said, physicality advantage in this game. You kind of wonder where their confidence is at. 
it's almost a culture game in a way for Kalen DeBoer in Alabama and setting his new culture this weekend. But I think that Brady Cook injury, you know, I, I think that really it takes – this takes the chances away from Missouri, even if he tries to give it a go, he's not going to be close to hundred percent. Right. So um, I, I like Alabama to meet Missouri this weekend and knock Missouri out, but that won't be Missouri's last loss either. Yeah, I agree. And of course, looking around the rest of the contenders in the sec, Georgia, Tennessee, both of them are idle this weekend. Right now, again, I mentioned that you got seven teams that are either undefeated or have one loss. After this weekend, I think that number will be about five. It could be down to four, depending on if, uh, you know, Alabama and Missouri, depending on the way that that game goes. Um, but of course, we're starting to get to the nitty gritty in terms of who will have a chance in Atlanta for the SEC championship game. Right now, Texas just needs to take care of Vanderbilt, knock them out of the picture and move forward going into their bye week after this weekend, uh, which leads us to really kind of that back stretch, you know, those final four games for everybody on the schedule in the regular season. We've seen just about seven or eight games from every team so far, Jerry, and I wanted to get into some teams that have surprised. I wanted to, to get in some teams that have disappointed. And of course, some coaches who were on the hot seat, because coming into the year, that was one of the big discussions. You got new coaches everywhere, you know, got new coach in Tuscaloosa, a new coach down in College Station, but you also got coaches that Texas would play at the beginning of the year that were on the hot seat. Right. Billy Napier, Sam Pittman. I mean, it wasn't all, you know, sunshine and rainbows for those guys to begin yep. the year. But we'll start with the most surprising team. Who's really kind of piqued your interest through about eight weeks right now that maybe you didn't expect to be in this conversation at the beginning of the year? Yeah. So for the team, most, let's say, most disappointing. Okay. It, for me, it's, I know Auburn fans would say Auburn, and I know Alabama fans would say Alabama, and the tickets for the Iron Bowl are going to be cheap. Uh, but I think it'd be tough to go against the Oklahoma fan base right now, right? With Brent Venables, I just don't, I, I don't see how they're not the most disappointing team in, in the SEC right now. Um, some Kentucky fans, but you know they're turning the basketball. They had a big scrimmage the other night, right? A wa- exhibition game, so they kind of turned the page. They're like, ah, it's normal. I will say, Ole Miss. Is right there too, though, you know. But Oklahoma, because it's not just that they've lost; it's how they've lost, and that put that it makes a for a disappointing team. Uh, Oklahoma has fifth scored fifty four points in four SEC games, and has given up one hundred and fifteen. I mean, could you imagine that? I mean, just to think about that plus minus. I mean, that right. that's an unbelievable number. They're one and three in the conference play and their schedules doesn't get easier. It gets more difficult. I mean, so that's the, that's the problem is, is, you know, Oklahoma has been the most disappointing team this year in the sec. And it's also impactful for Oklahoma because it's their first year in the sec. Yes. This one leaves a mark and and it can set you back a little bit. It raises questions about your your team and your program from your fan base. And when you look at their schedule, I mean, at Ole Miss, they have Ole Miss this weekend, right? They have Maine, but after that, it's LSU. It's Alabama. I mean, it, it, these are tough games they have remaining. There's a chance Oklahoma will, will not be favored probably in another game other than Maine. There's, There's a, chance a chance, Jerry, that they don't make a bowl game. Right. There's a chance they go five and seven, CJ. Yeah. That, Who I do you have? I'm with you. I, I mean, Oklahoma, it feels like the clear and obvious answer for most disappointing team. I don't think that's up for much debate at the moment, especially to your point, but the way that they've been losing, you know, it, it was ugly against Texas. It was even uglier against South Carolina, yes. right? You know, and it doesn't really feel like they have a direction right now to get better, right? They're going back to Jackson Arnold, but you just fired your offensive coordinator. You don't have an offensive line. You still have everybody under the sun at the receiving room in the, the medical tent. What's the saving grace right now? I don't know. I don't know. How does it get better for them? I don't know. It, it, it's the, worst, tough. the worst thing for a fan base is when they 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 don't see the answers. You, you feel them. hopeless. Yes. And offensively, I don't think the Oklahoma fans see the answer. Yeah, They don't have any answers. They're looking for answers. They don't think there are answers this year. That is a really bad place to be. Even if you're Ole Miss and you, know, you had playoff hopes, now you can still win out and get there. But, you know, Jackson Dart could go on a hot streak and you could get right back in this thing and your fan base is energized again, right? 
Um, Auburn has had some brutal losses this year, right? But they have a couple of chances late to kind of salvage a bad season. Uh, but that's been – even the Auburn fan base can look at their team and say, you know what? We had just bad turnovers at bad times. We have quarterback – we've had quarterback issues. But, you know, we ha- we've we moved the ball on people. I mean, Auburn looked better than Oklahoma didn't lost the game. I mean, that's the crazy thing about that one. And that was a home game. So, even Auburn fans see a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel. Not much, but yeah. a little bit. I'm just not sure Oklahoma fans do right now. No, I, I'm with you. Auburn, again, could have two wins on their schedule right now in conference play had it not been for costly turnovers, Oklahoma specifically, uh, but they've not looked good offensively. My second most disappointing team is Ole Miss. And, again, yeah. it's it, it's a team with a veteran quarterback and third year in the system, and you upgrade the trenches on both sides, and you still feel soft, right? That Kentucky loss looks worse and worse and worse by the week. And you were up by a touchdown with 45 seconds to go on the road in Death Valley, and you squander that game. Now you're sitting with two losses. You're out of the SEC picture. Playoff chance is still alive, but you got to absolutely woo everybody over with big wins down the rest of the road. So Oklahoma Ole Miss, those are the two for me. Uh, flipping the page, Jerry, let's get to the most surprising team. And I think that team might be who Texas plays this weekend. Yeah. Uh, Vanderbilt coming in right now with a number by their name. They're number 25 in the country. Uh, Of course, they're five and two on the season. They have the big win, the big staple win over Alabama. It feels like that's the clear cut answer right now. Yeah, because Vanderbilt, look, they weren't favored to beat Virginia Tech at home to start the year because some people have Virginia Tech as an ACC dark horse, right? That game, because Vanderbilt fans, and I don't think America really knew how good Diego Pavio it was as a quarterback, just a college quarterback. I'm not saying as a pro prospect, but he quickly made a believer out of his teammates and program and fan base. Right. And then they had the big win over Bama, the best win in program history. Not only did they do that, this is where things have changed for Vanderbilt. Not only did they not have their biggest program win in program history, they backed it up with a road win at Kentucky. That's just not what Vanderbilt fans are expecting, so they're all pinching themselves right now. Now Texas comes to town, and they're ranked 25th in the country. Nobody, nobody, probably Clark Lee and his coaching staff had Vanderbilt as a top 25 team after seven games this season. Right. And that's what Diego Pavia has done. Now they have older players, five seniors on the offensive line. Stowers is a senior at, at, at tight end. They have another tight end. That's a junior. They have some experienced players. Receiver Quincy Skinner's a senior. Um, they have some experience on the defensive front at linebacker and safeties are older senior players. So they have a more experienced team than I think people realize. But really, Diego Pavia has given this team belief in themselves and belief that they can go win games. Um, and CJ, if I, if I was looking at a second team that was maybe the most surprising, and it's due to injuries, I'd say LSU. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I mean, because if you lose Jacoby Giller, your bestie lineman, you lose Harold Perkins, who there it was kind of square peg round hole. They were trying to figure that whole thing out. But you lose Harold Perkins. You lose John Emery running back. So Caden Durham's had, had the opportunity, wouldn't have, to come on and be the best back on this team. Um, and then you've had some wide receiver injuries as well. Uh, so uh, LSU has not had a healthy season. And after that loss to USC, I think I wrote them off. I was like, phew, injuries. They lost to USC because I wasn't a USC believer. I was like, well, man, it could be that eight and four season for Brian Kelly. And man, the people aren't going to like it in Baton Rouge. And here he's, and maybe they still end up eight and four, but here he sits right now, top 10 in the country, undefeated in SEC play going to College Station. And I'm not sure after the USC game how many people actually were believing that would happen. No, I certainly wasn't. I was sitting around parading around thinking, man, my eight and four predictions looking great for yeah. LSU. They've made me eat crow so far, 100%. Now, of course, this game against AM is going to be huge for both teams. Of course, AM may be overachieving in their own right near one under Mike Elko. Of course, getting tested at home this weekend. We'll see how that game goes. Uh, another team that's kind of been surprising to me, and maybe that took a hit a, a week ago, but Arkansas. Yeah. I did not expect that to be the case, and we'll talk about that here in a second. But uh, Arkansas, you look at their two losses earlier in the year. There were both games that they probably should have won, right? That game uh, against Oklahoma State when they outgained Oklahoma State by about 220, 230 yards. 
four turnovers cost them the game there, and they were all timely, right? But they've surprised me. You know, I think that's one thing that for Texas fans, when they look at the rest of the schedule, boy, oh, boy, does that look tougher than it did at the beginning of the season. Uh, and Sam Pittman certainly coaching his way off of the hot seat right now. And before we get to coaches on the hot seat, Jerry, a quick word from my bookie, uh, who probably has some odds there on which coaches or which coach is the first to go out of the SEC teams. Absolutely. This episode of On Texas Football again is brought to you by the folks at my bookie. Make sure you're in the game with my bookie. Play any matchup, hundreds of college prop, player props, and more. The best part is you can do it anytime, anywhere, straight from your phone. Phone. Visit mybookie.ag and use promo code on Texas to get started. For those of you uh, and sign up now using my on Texas to cash in on double deposit bonus. It's a no brainer. Double cash in your account before you even place your first bet. But do not wait because it's available only for a limited time. Thank you again to my bookie. Of course, thank you, Jerry, for, for that read on my bookie. I mentioned it, but we're going to talk about coaches on the hot seat because Sam Pittman feels like he's coached his way off of it. That doesn't mean that there's nobody there because, again, coming into the year, it felt like Billy Napier was a dead man walking. Well, yeah. as we sit now, Florida's 4-3 and three in conference play. They're er, On the season, they're 2-2 two and two in conference play. Uh, Jerry, who amongst these SEC coaches will we not be seeing at SEC Ooh. Media Day next year? Man, CJ, it's tough because – you know, I still think Florida, I still think Billy Napier because the in the, the schedule in the SEC coming up, it's a tough one for him. But the reprie- like you said, the reprieve he gets is, you know, he's got a true freshman quarterback, DJ Lagway now. He's leaning on the guy, hey, look, I recruited this five-star quarterback. He's helping us turn it around. The other thing that helps Billy Napier, if they go on a losing streak in SEC play, they go to FSU at the end of the year. And barring an unforeseen change of events, they're going to beat FSU in Tallahassee. And if that game is a bowl, if that's a scenario where Florida gets into a bowl game, then I don't know if you fire him at six and six. I mean, maybe, maybe they do, but you got Georgia, you got at Texas, you got LSU, you got Ole Miss. That stretch is brutal. So, (laughs) I, I what I t- tend to believe, CJ, is they need to win one. Of, he needs to win one of those SEC games. I don't think he can go zero and four, right? Because he, I think he's going to need to win one of those, and then he's he needs to beat FSU. And at that point, has he done enough? I don't know. Um, you would think he might have, unless they already have a backroom deal with somebody. One of Jimmy Sexton's clients, and this thing is a wrap. It's already a done deal. Um, that's so that that's the one caveat to that. I gotta tell you, Oklahoma is interesting to me. And I'm not sitting here saying Brent Venables is gonna get fired. He just got a new contract, but I, I am here to tell you that they have Maine this week, right? And then after that, it, it gets tough. And um, sorry, they have, they're at Ole Miss. Sorry, this weekend. Then they have Maine, and then they have at Missouri, and they have Alabama, and at LSU. And look, if he loses to Ole Miss this week, then he's sitting at four and four. And Maine would take you to five and four. But then you have three games in a row, and if you lose all those games, and you're sitting there at five and seven, and you're, you're in the three. bottom third of the SEC. Fired your OC. What are they going to do? Right. I, I tend I tend to think he gets another year, but um, I, I I will say that it, it gets it gets iffy for him because if if Oklahoma feels like they're falling too far behind, if recruits start peeling the Michael Fasusis of the world, things such as that, then you have an issue. And you get because desperate. They've already, tried, they've already tried portal repair in the offensive line, and that's a two year deal. That can't be a one year deal. Um, and I'll tell you another crazy one there is we talked about how Sam Pittman got himself off the hot seat. Nothing puts you back on the hot seat like losing to Mississippi State this year. Mm. So they need to get that game. Because what happens if you lose that game and you just finish five and seven? Then what do they do? Yeah, and then that whole first half momentum evaporates. and They got to get the one this weekend against a bad Mississippi State team. I, I totally agree. And that line's only about six right now. So 
Yeah. Expected to be a bit closer than you might expect. Mississippi State also might have found some sort of offensive rhythm the last two weeks against Georgia and Texas A&M. Uh, but real quick, Jerry, just an outer safe. You know, do you think that they're safe for next year? Do you think yeah. that maybe they they might be on the outside? Uh, we'll start with Hugh Freeze and Auburn. Safe. Kentucky Mark Stoops. Mm. Boy, he tried to leave last year. It's a hard thing to forget for a university. He was on a plane. He was out of there. At, at one and four in conference right I'll now. Say, I'll, I'll say not safe. Not safe. Because of last year. but Because he got on the plane and was leaving to go to A&M. I think that changes that. But he's done so much as a head coach at Kentucky. I want to say safe. If it wasn't for that jumping on a plane, thinking you're going AM, and I'd say safe. But I think that makes it those it puts it in the air a little bit more. Shane Beamer in South Carolina, safe, safe. Yeah, because really? I think he's going to beat A and M in two weeks. Oh, okay. I kind of like that. And here's one more for you, and we'll wrap it up on this one. Lane Kiffin and Ole Miss, very safe. Do you think Lane Kiffin's locked into Ole Miss? No. That might be interesting to see. I think Florida's appealing to him if Florida comes open. That'll be interesting at the end of the year, depending on obviously how Florida finishes and what kind of momentum Billy Napier and his program have come the end of the year. So, Hey, CJ, here's the big question, though. If Florida comes open, Jimmy Sexton's dominated the SEC. His hires get those jobs. Would you hire Lane Kiffin or Kirk Sinetti? <laughs> I'm I'm calling Kurt Signetti ten times out of ten. Hundred percent. That would break me with what that, the success Indiana's had this year. If the Florida job comes open, if we're playing the if game, we'll see if Jimmy Sexton has all the power or just ninety percent of the power on hires in the SEC. That that that'll be really interesting to see at the end of the year. Of course, right now, long ways to go. And again, I mentioned it: seven teams alive theoretically for the SEC. Uh, championship game. Uh, two of them will be knocked out and a couple other dominoes will fall over the next few weeks. Uh, but for, for Jerry Hamilton, I'm CJ Vogel. This has been on Texas football's edition of Texas versus the SEC brought to you by my bookie. Of course, Texas at Nashville or at Vanderbilt this week in Nashville. Got to come away with the victory and we'll move forward toward next week. Welcome.